Um, if you could go ahead and find the slide, Becky, um, the one with the QR code for questions from the announcements. I want to cover that real quick. So, um, there's a couple things I want to cover real quick. So this is our new series we're going to start. We're going to start a series on what is the church, but here's my drive behind this. One of my drives behind why we're studying the church is, we're going to read some stats here real quick, that there's a lot of people who aren't committed to the church anymore and are failing to commit to the church. And I think some of that is because we've started to believe it's not really that important. But here's what I do know, is that as we go through this series, some of you are going to have questions about the church. And so you see the QR code up there that we want at the end of the service. So if you have a phone and you want to go ahead and pull it out and shoot that thing, it'll bring up a Google form. And in the, as we go through this series over the next three weeks, if you all have questions, that's how I would like you to submit them. And then once Landis is here and I'm here for the final week, we'll go through some of those questions for you guys. So does that make sense? So if you have questions, as we're going through this series and go, well, how is our church different than a Catholic church? Or how is our view of baptism different than someone else's view of baptism? That's where I want you to start putting those together so we can actually give you full responses. Okay? Does that make sense? So you can shoot the QR code that's on the screen. You can also do the one that's in your notes. I would also tell you, most of you are used to me preaching what we call expositionally. So I have you turn to a certain passage and we go verse by verse. This series is more topical. So we're going to be in multiple places, multiple verses. But I've done this, and you see it on your notes, in a question and answer format. So there's going to be a question. We're going to go investigate from Scripture what the Bible says about it. And then we're going to come to an answer, and you're going to fill in the blank. So does that make sense? So I'm excited for that. As we're going through this series, um, one last thing before we get started is there are these two books. Um, readers, leaders are readers. I'm encouraging you. I'm not telling you you have to take one. But there's some of these back there in the corner where Miss Lisa's at and Rob's at behind them on the counter. There's these stacks of books. If you will read them, I'd encourage you to pick up one of the two. Or you can pick up both over the course of these weeks. So I'll keep a stack out there as long as they last. So this one is about rediscovering church. This is one of the, this is kind of what themes the series. So if you want, I'm not going to cover everything that's in this book. There's some things I'll touch on. And then this is, I am a church member, so it's about the commitments we make as a church member. This one is 80 pages. This one's like 100 and, 145. I'm telling you, um, both are really great. I'm personally reading this one. I've read this one before. But anyway, there's a free back there. So if you will read them, I would encourage you to take them. If you're not going to read them, if this becomes your latest paperweight or the latest donation to Goodwill, I would encourage you to leave it there and not pick one up. All right, does that make sense? All right, so you excited to learn some about the church? Can somebody tell me, um, as we get started, what is church? Let's go ahead and try to define the word church. But what, what is church as, as a whole? A group of people. A group of people. There you go. So that's, is it church anything else? A community. What? Yep. Okay. All right. So we're going to go through all of that. You, you've nailed it all. I, was, I thought some of you would think it was like building. Because isn't this the church? No. No? The church, the, the church is the people. Well, I guess you've been trained well. Do we even need this series? No. 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 Okay. So we're smart. Okay. All right, so here, I'm going to read this study about all the dumb people, then, since you're so smart. So, all right, so here's, um, I'm going to pray for us real quick. Well, actually, I'm going to read this, then I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll go through it. Um, as you can see, preaching topically, I'm not... It's my normal, not my normal flow. But you'll see I'm way more personal when I'm doing this. So anyway. All right, here's, here's what this is. So this is from Tom Rainer. He does a bunch of church statistics. 
So he says this about the church. And I would say this, thankfully FBK is not the typical church, but here's, here's what he talks about. There's these uh, church members that are lacking in church attendance and commitment. He says, if your church is typical, over one half, 50% of your members attend one out of four weeks or less. The typical church in America right now, if you are a member of a church, they attend one out of four Sundays. So if you're here, more than one out of every four Sundays, go ahead and put your hands up. There you go. Give yourself a round of applause. There you go. You're above typical. He goes on to say this. He says, I am convinced that the decreasing commitment to church members to their local churches is one of the greatest problems in our culture today. He says, it is greater than politics, more than, more than petty social media, and more than divisions related to the pandemic is the problem that we're not committed to, to God's church. We're not committed to being here. We're not committed to growing as a people. He moves on down here and he gives five reasons, really, that we fail to commit to the church. He says, first, we fail to see that the local church is God's plan, A, to do his mission on earth, and that he makes no plan B. He goes on to continue. He says, we embrace the false notion that commitment to a local church is legalistic. How many of you have heard that before? This, oh, why are you committed to church? It's like, he says, no one would ever look at you and tell you your commitment to your family is legalistic. Your, your extreme commitment to family is, is too hyper, should actually be dumbed down. Should, it's not that serious. It's not that big of a deal. He says, but we do that when it comes to the church. Does that explain legalistic? Yeah, okay. The point is, whenever somebody says it's legalistic, it says you're making, too, you're making a bigger deal out of this than it needs to be. You're, you're forcing the rules too much. You can be lighter. You can have more grace. Verse number three, he says, we have let culture dictate our schedules. So this is one that um, I'm passionate about, and one of the reasons I wanted to do this series with you guys is because I grew up in a church like you guys did, and I watched my friends and others get their driver's license and then not coming to church anymore. And the idea here is that church is not important. And so what we do is we're doing school and we're doing sports and we're doing life and church is something we just fit in. But then what I'm going to be honest and tell you guys about is your relationship with God and your commitment to a family of faith, commitment to a church should be consistent that run throughout your lifetime. And what I'm trying to just tell you, and I'm not trying to scare you, because school is great, friendships are great, sports are great, but those commitments end. There is a certain point where you will graduate high school, and all of you will look at your friends and go, we're going to be friends forever. <laughs> Ask any adult in the room how many high school friends they still have after so many years. One. Best friends forever is... Is, is hopeful at best. The other thing is that you think sports are going to last forever, but there's a point when either your body gives out or you're done. And you go through college, and I saw friends after friends after friends move away from church, move away from God, get through high school, get through college, and they don't know what they're doing with their life. And the church is one of the ways God has given us actually a mission and direction for our lives. So he moves on number four. He says, um, we've accepted arguments about gathering as the local church, that it's not really that important, that we can do it at home, that we can do it somewhere else, that life on life doesn't matter. And then number five, he says, we see church as a place to be served rather than to serve. So that's one we're going to come back to at the very end of this series, is the fact that church, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, church is for you. Be with others who are believers. But it's not ultimately about you. Who's it about? Jesus. It's about Jesus. And it's about being together to encourage one another towards love and good deeds so that we can go represent him as the church when we're scattered. That's one of the cool things about this book is they say the church, church is not just the church gathered, but we still are the church in a way that we represent God when we're scattered, when we're living in the world.
Okay? So, with that, let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to run through these questions and have a great time. God, I thank you for this time together in your word. I pray that we would be attentive to your word. I pray that we would learn from it, that we would enjoy this study, that we would be committed to your church. In your name, all God's people said? Amen. All God's people said? Amen. I missed that. Amen. Especially like um, Amen. Yes. when I was on Christmas break. Right. Specifically. So. Alright, first up, we have ecclesiology. I have the word ecclesiology. Does anyone know? Go back up to this. Does anyone? Well, there's the answer right there. Um, ecclesiology. What does it mean? Okay, you can say this in unison. What does it mean? All right, does anybody want to? So, so here's the deal. When we're learning, what's theology? Study about God. Does anyone want to parse the Greek and tell me how that's divided up? Because these Bible words, this is one of the things I'm hoping to accomplish with this series, is to help introduce you to some very complicated Bible words that should not be complicated or difficult because it took me a long time to figure them out. Like eschatology. Esca means end times. So it's the ology, study of what? So it's end times, study, and then in English it translates to study of end times. So does anyone want to parse? I saw these guys over here. Do you all want to parse it? Tell me what, what this part does. Does anyone want to... Do you all know? Does Joel or Brian know? Theology, a lot of them. I don't know. Okay. So theology is the study of God. This is ecclesiology. So the word in the first part is the Greek word for ekklesia, which means the gathered, the church assembly. It's the word in our New Testament that's translated church. So it's the gathering, and then it's the study of the gathering. So this is the study of the church. So the gathered church. Moving on to the question for tonight. We're going to go, what is a church? Does someone want to tell me what the difference is, for bonus points, between a big C church and a little C church? Yeah. I think the big C church refers to all believers everywhere, and little C church either refers to the building or the smaller group. Logan nailed it. Yeah, you can give it up to Logan. There you go. Alright, so Big C Church. Big C Church represents, and I messed it up actually on your notes, but that's a whole different story. Big C Church represents the universal church, believers in Jesus Christ, who are connected to one another as family throughout all time, throughout all history, in all places of the world. We talk about Big C Church is the universal church. Christ, we're going to read from Ephesians here in a minute that Christ gave himself for the church, the ecclesia, the gathering. But they're going to use that in a way to say, hey, everyone who's part of God's family. And then a little C church, when we use it, is a local gathered assembly. So we would consider our church, First Baptist Kettering, a lower C church in that all of us are gathering in a physical location. Okay. So here are some things the church is not. You can put these on your notes. And I'm also going to give some scripture points for what the church is. And we're going to go to some scriptures. But here, the church is not a building slash a place. You guys have already covered this. The next slide there, Becky. It's not on there. Is it not on there? Well, then hop to the next one. Oh, no, wait. None of these are there. I know what I did. I remember now what I did. The church is not a building or a place. It's the people. We've already covered this. It's also not a performance. We can start to think church is a performance. This is that consumer mindset that we're coming and it's about what we can enjoy and receive. This is one of the dangers of what they call the attractional church model where you're trying to get people to come for a concert or for snacks or for an experience. But it's not a performance. It should be done with excellence, but it's not just a performance. It's not like a concert. It's also not merely traditional. It's not something we do just because for thousands of years people have done this. It's something that's actually rooted in Scripture. And it's not um, primarily, I put on here, denominational in my notes, in that it's not something that's just specific 
to um, certain groups of Christians. It's supposed to be inherent to all groups of Christians. And the fact that it is denominational, but it's not just merely denominational, it's bigger than that. So a church, no denomination owns the phrase the church. That's what I'm kind of going after. I see some wheels turning and some people looking at me. It's not owned just by one people, uh, but all of God's people. So first, it is biblical. That's what's on the slide. We're going to get into some passages that back that up. But we find that I was doing the study on this, pulled up my English concordance. The word ecclesia, gathering, both local and universal, is in the New Testament over 70 times. This is something Jesus instituted. It's something he instructed for us to do and for us to be a part of. So it's biblical. It's also a family. In Matthew 12, 50, Jesus talks about this in, in a special way when he says, For whoever does the will of my Father, and in this passage it's worded differently, but Jesus is trying to communicate that those who actually follow God, who's Jesus' Father, he says, God the Father, he says, In heaven is my brother, sister, and mother. His brother, sister, and mother. He means family. He's trying to stress to the extreme that those who actually follow God, mean truly follow God, God of the Bible, he's saying they are family. There's a part of us where when you belong to the body of Jesus Christ, when we are members and we are Christians, that is a tighter bond than even the family that we grew up in, or our grandparents or others. Scripture would teach us that that commitment, that family bonding of us being Christians and someone else being a Christian is more um, important. It's more telling of who we are as a person than our even genetics to family. And so he says this, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This means family. That's what he's stressing there. It's also a body. So it is a body. And he talks about this idea, this is one of the most famous pictures that is used for the church is that it says this 12 for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body though many are one body so it is with Christ he's saying it's not just one um, element it's all of us together are the body of Christ it says um, though many are one body so it is with Christ verse 13 for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. It's this idea of we've all been given new spiritual life. We've all been entered into a family through the spirit. It says, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And then finally, we also see two other things. It is important. We're going to see that Jesus died for the church. This is God's plan of reaching the world, is to do it through the church. Do it through his people. Ephesians 5.25, he does this, he tells us how precious the church is through a picture of a husband and wife. So he says this, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus died for the church, that we could have a relationship with God. And he says, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. This idea that Christ died for the church so that we could be holy, so that we could have a forever relationship with God. That's who the church is. It's people who, it, it's important. So moving to the next one, it says, it will not be overthrown. So we have all these different bullet points. The last one I said is it will not be overthrown. The fact is the church is going to exist forever. The body of Christ is going to exist forever. And Jesus has committed to that. I have the verse up there, verse 18. Jesus is going through this section and he, Peter is talking about you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says on this rock, on this truth, the fact that I am the Christ, the Messiah, the living son of God, he says, I will build my church. Jesus is the foundation. There's multiple passages that talk about that. And it says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So this is one of the reasons people were taking courage. This is one of those verses, as we went into COVID, 
a year and a half ago or whatever. People were like, is the church forever going to disband? Is it going to last? We have this scriptural promise from Jesus that the church is going to last. That Satan's never going to be able to snuff it out. He says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So here's your blank. Answer to what is a church in, in a simplified form. I just gave you some bullet points that would help in some scripture passages is this. It's a group of people who know they've been loved by Christ and have begun to love one another like that. Okay? So that's, how, that's what the church is as, as an organization. It's a group of people who know they've been loved by Christ and have begun to love one another like that. Now, the question we should be asking at this point is the one that's on your paper. Who gets to be in that group of people? Who is that group of people? So the question that we have on the notes is, who can belong to a church? And we're speaking specifically here of a local church. Who can belong to a church? So first we're going to see this, that it's those who are saved, those who are born again. The first bullet point I have there is that we're born again. Jesus says, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. He says that to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. The verse is, Jesus answered him, truly I say to you, unless one is born again. Now something fun about this. Where is this over here? Oh, it's right here. He says, born again. There's a footnote in your ESV. How many of you have ESV and you have a footnote there? Some of the rest of you probably have footnotes in other translations. The um, original writing of this is vague in a way that it means born again, but it also means born from above. It has a connotation of being born of that which is heavenly, that which is spiritual. So Jesus is tipping Nicodemus off to the fact that he's saying, hey, you must be born again. You must be born of that which is heavenly, that which is above. And he moves forward, he says he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus gets confused and says, how can a man be born when he is old? So Nicodemus doesn't pay attention to the, the born from above part, the above part. He gets fixated on the born part because he's like, how can I be born again? Can't do that. That doesn't sound good at all. And then no, verse number five, it says, Jesus answered. So Jesus kind of was like, let me clear this up for you. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he says, pay attention, unless one is born of water, which most of us would, and most commentators would agree this is being physically born and that you were alive, and it says born of the Spirit, that's born of heaven, that means spiritually alive, and that you trusted Christ and you've been given salvation. He says, unless you've been born of what, so you're alive, you've been born once in your family, and then you've been born into God's family. He says, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He said, this is the requirement to pass into God's forever kingdom, is that we've been born and we're alive, and we've been given life, but then we've also trusted Christ and have spiritual life, that we've been born of the Spirit. He also says, or I'm having my notes wrong thing before we get to the next part. This can happen, it's important for you all to realize this, this can happen not just, this doesn't just happen at church. Being born both, being born spiritually can happen at home as well. There are certain um, religions and other things that would say, hey, this is the only place you can make certain decisions. But the Bible would tell us anyone who confesses with their mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord can be saved. So it's important for us to realize that when we're born again of the Spirit, we can, that can happen. It can happen at church. Some people are saved at church. How many of you, and for those who are saved, how many remember have made a spiritual decision or you were saved at church? We'll, we'll raise hands here. All right. Um, mine was actually down because I wasn't saved at church. How many of you were saved outside of church or made, made significant spiritual decisions away from church, being like the gathered church building? Okay. See? Is God bound by the church walls? No. As far as the building is concerned, not the gather church because you're all going to correct me from now on because you're all smart all right moving on next one it says we are adopted as sons and daughters so being in the church who can join the church is those who are born spiritually those who have been saved but as we're saved 
It also includes this being born again, but it also includes being adopted as sons and daughters. It includes being adopted as God's children. Galatians 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem, to buy back those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. I will clarify this. The son's word is plural in the original language. So it's the idea of both men and women. This idea of offspring of children. That's, that's the idea that's being conveyed here. It's a plural son. So it's like y'all. It means all your kids. That he might adopt both sons and daughters into God's family. So the y'all doesn't translate well into English. But anyway. But this is the idea. It's not only do we have new spiritual life, but we also have a new heavenly father, but we also have siblings. And that when we gather as the church, when we embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, not only do we receive spiritual life, but we also receive God as our father, and we have brothers and sisters in Christ. We're accepted into a family. Finally, we get to see that we are set apart. That we are set apart. I have there Ezekiel 36 and then 1 Peter. Before I read the 1 Peter passage, these are ones that you can just write down. Um, both of these speak specifically about God's people being separate. And I heard a really good explanation of this um, from Passion just two days ago. Um, someone was describing this being set apart. And this idea, um, Passion's a conference in Atlanta, Georgia, with a bunch of college students who are following Jesus and gather together. But for those, but the, the illustration is this. When we think about being set apart, when the Bible talks about being set apart, how many of you have um, plasticware dishes like Tupperware in your house that gets used on a regular basis? Like the one that you pull out for like popcorn, the one you pull out for like spaghetti or things that like stain things. How many of you have a, like a glad container that's almost orange? <laughs> Dude, that's a lot of you. <laughs> okay, so think about it. You have common wear that your parents and you use on a regular basis. How many of you have parents, some of them may not have this, who have a certain set of china, maybe it's in a cabinet, maybe it's somewhere where you can't get, maybe it's from their wedding, maybe you've never seen it before. Maybe they've never even let you touch it. How many of your parents have that? Okay. So that china is what? It is It is set apart. So tell me what it is set apart. It is not common. It is not in the same category with the Tupperware bowl that you use for your popcorn and then you want, rinse it off and you use it for your ice cream. Okay? Not the same bowl. It's set apart. In the same way, God is set apart from us in a similar way. But even this illustration breaks down because God is so transcendent and separate in a certain way where he's not even in the same category as China or like dishware. But think about that concept of it being set apart. And so when we get to this, I'm going to read 1 Peter um, chapter 2, where it says this about God's family and being set apart. It says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people... For his, being God's own possession, that you may. He says, you belong to God. You belong to God so that, for this reason, to accomplish this, person, this purpose, that you may proclaim the excellencies, the beauty of him, being God, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who called you out of sin and gave you spiritual light. It then continues, it says, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have re received mercy. And then he gives them instructions. You heard me read some of this on Sunday. He tells them how they're to be set apart. He says, you've been chosen. Part of this is you've been saved, you've been chosen. You're in God's family. And he says, this is how you live set apart. How you continue to live as God's family. 